Hi, it's Robert Mitchell, and I'm here in Toronto International Film Festival. Hi. Good, how are you? Good, thanks. Welcome to Midnight Madness. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here.
And I said, maybe he's still alive. You know, if you want to play him again. Maybe he's Ted Kaczynski and he's in a cabin somewhere in the mountains <laughs> sending off letterbox. <laughs> and uh, I can see a Bob's face go off. You know? <laughs> That's not the payday my agent was telling me about. <laughs> stood up too fast, there's still going to be a movie here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but it's something uh, completely different than uh, anything I've done, and, uh, and, uh, and it, aggressively so. Um, and uh, I'm going to, you know, answer some questions after. Now, I understand, though, unfortunately, uh, Nicolas Cage and Walter Poe couldn't be here, but, oh, just wait for it. We worked on this. We worked on this so hard. We have the world premiere of an introduction from Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Such a treat. This movie is exactly the sort of movie I want to be making right now. <laughs> I've been working with Paul Schrader for my third time, and I was reunited once again with Willem Dafoe, and it hasn't been since uh, Wild at Heart. I'm happy to say that it was a lot of fun, and there was some chemistry, and uh, Christopher Matthew Cook is fantastic in the movie. I think you're going to be going for a wild ride tonight, so open your minds and, and bring it in. Roll! is, why Cleveland, Taylor Swift, and Humphrey Bogart? Uh, the novel is set in Los Angeles. We got a uh, million dollars in tax credits to go in Ohio. Uh, Taylor Swift? Taylor Swift because uh, it was in the Matt Wilder script and also because she rules the world. <laughs> and then Humphrey Bogart? Well, that you know, that was not in the book, not in the script. That was something Nick was evolving at. <laughs> and uh, he, he had this bogey thing and he was doing it, and I, I didn't care much for it. Uh, I, I figured I could cut around it and not, I didn't have to worry. But at one point in the shooting, he said, you know, the scene at the end with the black couple, I, I just don't get that scene. I don't know how to play it. I don't know why I'm still alive. <laughs> and I said, well, maybe you're not still alive. Maybe it's an after death scene. And he said, oh, oh. And, uh, and so then we came to shoot the scene and we're reading through it. And he starts reading through it and doing it all as a free boy. I go, wow. And Nick, you know, uh, we're, 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 you know, why are you doing that? <laughs> and he said, well, you said that maybe he was dead. And if he was dead, he gets to be Humphrey Bogart, who, who he always wanted to be. And, uh, oh, yeah, uh, you know. And uh, I said, you know, but we don't have enough time to shoot it twice. So if you do this, we're going to be stuck with it. And he said, well, you've been telling me for weeks now that we've got to be bold. And uh, this is a bold choice. And I said, yeah, yeah, it is a bold choice. <laughs> so he, he gets to be a Humphrey Bogart to save the black couple, but he still fucks up anyway. Um, how, how do you channel, I mean, the, the thing that I like about this is both their performances are just like so high-pitched. I mean, especially, I mean, Blue the Pope. Mad Dog is an incredible character. I mean, right from the beginning. Um, what's it like working with, work with him before, like, Sleeper? What's your relationship with him, uh, director? Well, you know, it's interesting. He's done a number of smaller roles for me. The last time he did a, a day player role, he said, I'll do it for you, but don't ask me again. The next time you ask me, I want something more substantial. And uh, I took that to Howard. And then I sent this script to Nick for that role, Mad Dog. And Nick says, I'd like to do it, uh, but uh, I want to play, I don't want to play the crazy character, I want to play the straight character. 
And so then um, I had actually the best role to offer the Willow. And, uh, you know, retaining them 25 years after a while at heart. And uh, so, again, yeah, that's how it, uh, and, and, and actually, I, I think um, Nick is better because of the competition for Willow. <laughs> I mean, with, with, with Willem, how do you kind of channel it? Did, did he just kind of run with it, like, the, or was it all in the script? Uh, well, the book wasn't uh, a copy, and the script really wasn't. But as we kind of get into it, I started thinking more about it. This stuff is funny. <laughs> and, and, and then when I read that opening scene, I said, I, I, I want to make this movie. You know, no matter what comes later, and I was only 20 pages into the script, I said, I, I can rewrite everything, but this whole scene is great. And, um, and the deeper I got into it, the more macabre it all seemed, and trying to do a crime film in the 20 teens, after Scorsese, after Tarantino, after Guy Ritchie, uh, I just knew that we had to um, be loosey-goosey, and I, I had final cut because of, uh, of a, I had had a bad situation with the film with Nick was taken away from me, and uh, and we said to I said to each other at the time I said uh, you know Nick if we live long enough we need to work together again to remove this stain from our clothes, and uh, and then the script came by and I thought oh yeah, this might be the one, and he wanted to do it then all of a sudden now I'm doing a crime film, I have no intention of I. Never written a crime film, never done a crime film. And so then I had to sort of study the genre and figure how do you make it feel, you know, bunker sensibility is the 70s, it was set in the 90s. How do you make it feel like 2016? And so that was the, the challenge. Do we have any questions for the audience here? Yeah. Thank you so much for your body of work. <laughs> Uh, just talking about the timeline spanning the different uh, periods for the source material as well as uh, your career, was there something you were mindful of mixing in all of these times? Because some of the editing is kind of frenetic and very current, but also it, it feels time from the 70s and all sorts of things. Yeah, I mean the film is and, uh, it's, it's really more about crime films than it is about crime. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of history of crime films in there, you know, that a lot of from uh, Point Blank, you know, Lady, I Don't Have the Time, and uh, all of that sort of stuff, and those references. But um, it, it, this gets to a, a kind of um, more theoretical uh, answer. But I, I, I don't really believe, well, we used to believe in unified style. And I don't, I think your generation, people raised with multimedia, uh, I, I don't think you need to have unified style anymore. Uh, I think that uh, I, I can do whatever I want and you'll put it together. Uh, and I remember, I realized this when I was watching a film by Xavier Goulart, uh called Beautiful Creatures. And I said, look, he, do, he did a Godard scene, now he's doing a Bertolucci scene. Then he did a Casabetti scene, and now he's doing a, uh, a, a static cinema scene. And, he, and he's 20 years old, you know, he just doesn't know that you're not supposed to do this. And it works. And, uh, and, and that was a revelation to me. So uh, I shot, you know, everything. The style just jumps wildly all over the place. And, uh, and I thought that was appropriate for her. I mean, the question was about uh, writing, rewriting, uh, improvisation with the actors. I mean, uh, in, in this particular film, uh, you, you want to give the actors a, a bit of rope. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Nick tends to be hyper prepared, so it was good that, that uh, Willow was uh, throwing his rhythm off. I mean, the funniest line in the movie came from rehearsal. 
with Nick was saying, what's that thing you put in the baby's mouth? <laughs> and Willem says, Nick, and then Willem says, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. And I said, no, it's funny, it's leave it in. Uh, so, you know, that, that's sort of how it works. Uh, what people often think of in improvisation movies occurs, but it usually occurs in the rehearsal time, not on the set. And uh, to tell you about the writer, um, I, um, I, I, I like Matthew's script a lot. It had to be short enough for financial reasons. But um, I, I do a kind of nasty thing, uh, which is uh, I always retype a script. And so I just do everything all over again. And so then I'm on the set and I'm looking at it and I say, oh, I remember when I wrote this. <laughs> but I didn't write it, I just retyped it. But now I own it. <laughs> Matthew, where's Matthew? Stand up there. Take a bow. <laughs> and I, I'm watching this, I'm like, this is like watching someone who's horrible at playing Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> <laughs> they're all just losers and they're just careening out of control. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I described the film as three scuzzballs fighting their way to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and I, I played that song uh, by Porter Wagner at the end of Satan's Got a River because that's how I sort of saw these guys, three guys swimming in Satan's River and they're never going to make it across. <laughs> and, and could you talk about casting yourself as Greco? Um, that, that, you know, I, all through my career I produced to do a cameo and the crew always tries to get you on screen. And I always figured I would be, I disliked myself so much I, I would cut myself out. I had this uh, our, uh, discussion with Scorsese, a taxi driver, because when somebody got injured, he decided to take that person's role. And I begged him, and Ari said, don't do it, don't do it. Because I, 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 like, I like the scene, and I thought he would see himself, not like himself, and cut the scene out. Well, the opposite happened. He saw himself, he loved himself. <laughs> <laughs> and he made the scene as long as he could be the man. <laughs> And, but I, I, I had that same feeling myself, and uh, uh, Marty, in fact, was going to play the Greek, and then it fell on his birthday, and he had to cancel. Uh, I, had, I had asked Tarantino, I had asked Abel Ferrara, uh, I had asked uh, Nolte, Goldblum, Walken. Uh, I, I even asked Rupert Everett to do it as a transgender gangster. Uh, and uh, and uh, and Nick just kept saying, the way you should do it. And then we shot it at the end of the schedule, and by that time, we were out of money. And even if one of these people had agreed to do it, we couldn't have even pay for the plane ticket. So I got stuck doing it. Not uh, $900 for three scenes. You, know, you, you can't work much cheaper than that. And, uh, you know, I just said, you know, the people, the local people were not very interesting. And I said, look, I may be bad, but I'm going to be interesting. <laughs> so student filmmakers, if you can raise more than $900, I think you're going to be So uh, it's interesting because we started this film festival, we started Midnight Madness with Free Fire, which was produced by Martin Scorsese. Now we're kind of coming full circle. But, but can you talk about the freedom that you had? Or was there a sense of freedom with working with a low budget? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it, 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 because it was really a final cut. And, and I knew we had to be outrageous because I, I, I put together this younger group of, uh, of department heads. It was the first uh, full-time credit for all of them. Uh, uh, all sex department heads had never had a full credit before. So they were all very eager to uh, 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 you know, tackle this medium. And, and, I, and I chose them because I was looking for, I, I didn't want people who were going to think outside the box. I wanted people who were outside the box. And didn't even know they were thinking outside the box, <laughs> and uh, and that freed me up from the incrustation of you know four decades of, of working in commercial cinema. And, but I, when I pulled them together, I said, um, you know, the bad news is we don't have the kind of money to make this in a traditional way. The good news is I have Final Cut, and we can make any fucking film we want. <laughs> <laughs> and let's just be bold, and just, you know, whatever it is, just, you know, give it a try. Right, put your hands together, Paul Schrader!